Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Kari Nadeau, uh, who is the uh, Natasi Foundation Professor of Pediatric Food Allergy, Immunology, and Allergy. Uh, Dr. Nadeau is also Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine, and by courtesy, Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, or ENT as the older of, uh, of us call it. Um, she's the director of the Sean Parker Center for Allergy Research at Stanford and the section chief of Allergy and Asthma. But I think more, more importantly, Kari, the work that you and your lab are doing is absolutely transforming care for, for our, our pediatric patients and adult patients, and we are also grateful and can't wait to hear what you'll say today. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here because um, our beginning started here, and I can't thank the MCHRI and many of you who have been my mentors along the way to be able to create the nurturing environment at Stanford, to be able to have the data that I have today to be able to show you. So it's really thanks back to you for um, my being able to be of service and try to help the community and, and children. Um, at Lucille Packard, but also uh, beyond that. So thank you again for inviting me here today. It's really exciting. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, there we go. So I'm going to give sort of an overview of allergic diseases, allergies and asthma in particular, and then we're going to talk about prevention and diagnosis and then therapy in specific uh, examples so that you can see some of the hope and promise that is being delivered upon by rigorous science. Allergic diseases are increasing around the globe, unfortunately. They range from life-threatening anaphylaxis to food allergies to asthma, and those are the ones I'll be particularly talking about today. But they also include rhinitis, conjunctivitis, angioedema, urticaria, eczema, eosinophilic disorders, drug and insect allergies, and unfortunately, all aspects of medicine, every single specialty area, is affected by allergy. Whether or not you're a cardiologist and it has to do with aspirin desensitizations, or whether or not you're a general pediatrician who's trying to figure out what exactly those IgE tests are and whether or not to refer you to an allergist, or whether or not you're an anesthesiologist who has to worry about allergic uh, manifestations of anesthesia, for example. So I think we need to understand more about what's causing them, how to prevent them, and how to better diagnose them. And why is this important? Well, this is a public health concern. Allergies affect many people around the world, especially children. The world population is growing. More and more people are being burdened by allergic disorders, especially asthma. Many of these still cause high rates of morbidity and mortality. It's an epidemic. Just in the US alone, one in every three individuals has an allergic disease sometime in their lifetime. One in 12 children under the age of 21 has a doctor's diagnosis of food allergy, and one in 25 adults, we think, has a doctor's diagnosis of food allergy, although those numbers are increasing as well. We used to think that more children would grow out of their food allergies when they became adults. That's less and less the case, and about 50% of adults that have food allergies learn about that when they're adults, so it's new onset adult food allergy, unfortunately. The WHO published this uh, data recently, about 250 million suffer from food allergies, and that's uh, been mostly validated by questionnaires. Um, 300 people suffer from asthma globally, and uh, that's about one in every eight Americans. So most of that is children, unfortunately, and one in 10 of the world population suffers from, from some form of drug allergies. And here's the latest on the world map of the food allergy prevalence. Unfortunately, what you're seeing there in gray does not necessarily mean that those countries don't have food allergies. It just means that we don't have the data yet. But we used to think that food allergies was really something that was in the US, in Australia, and in the United Kingdom specifically. You can see there, Australia is quite uh, purple, unfortunately, and that's because they have the highest rate of um, food allergies. And we think there are several reasons for that, which I'll get into. But I think by understanding the epidemiology, we can really try to understand those numbers to be able to dive deep into what are the potential associations, what's causing this rise, what's causing the rate of food allergies and other allergies and asthma in these populations, and then how can we think about preventing that? So when we look at these integrated symptoms, and uh, I'm so glad that uh, Tony Oro and I were recently at a, 
uh, Keystone Conference in Germany where we really tried to think about systems approaches to diseases. And I think allergies and asthma are particularly um, ripe to be able to understand the omics approach, both hypothesis driving and hypothesis driven research. And because allergy is present in most all organs, we can look at neuroimmunology, look at itch receptors in the neuroimmune axis, mast cells in specific tissues, asthma related to the lung, allergic rhinitis, and eye diseases as well, atopic dermatitis or eczema or dry skin, and then also anaphylaxis, which for the medical terminology means that more than two organs have been involved in an allergic reaction. That doesn't mean that it's life-threatening, but that's what we define as anaphylaxis. The lay public defines it as something slightly different, but it's important to differentiate that. And again, all these organ systems and genetic predisposition and environment inter are interwoven. So when we think about prevention, first we need to understand why. And this is a compendium of all the epidemiological studies that are known to date with rigor that have shown associations between certain features and increased risk of allergies versus decreased risk. So I just kind of put it together in a slide format here. So genetics does, to some extent, protect you if you have more regulatory T cells, for example, although that's hard to find. Um, a diet with fresh vegetables, a Mediterranean-type diet, decreases your risk of allergies and asthma by about fourfold. Uh, so for those of you who have this diet, and for um, Tom who promotes this, I, I hope that you know that it's, it's a good idea on many fronts. Um, vitamin D also helps. The reason why Australia actually, we think, has one of the highest rates of food allergies is they do not supplement any of their foods with vitamin D or calcium. So, and from the very beginning, they are doing a slip, slap, slop skin cancer prevention. So they usually, in their babies, have hypovitamin D. Uh, and so because of that, they showed great associations between low vitamin D and increased allergies and asthma. Animals, if we could, if we could all roll around and go back to where uh, we used to be on farms, that would be great, but that's not necessarily the case anymore. All my families were farmers, um, but you know, I grew up on the farm in the summertime, but that wasn't the case that uh, when we moved to a city. So these things are now just part of who we are as a society. And we are learning that it's important to have certain microbiota, certain good dirt, to be able to protect us to, from allergies and asthma. And those are validated in many uh, rigorous studies now that have been going around the globe. There are certain microbiome with, that have been associated with improvements in allergies and asthma, and then diet early in childhood, early and often. It used to be the American Academy of Pediatrics 10 years ago had a guideline to delay, delay, delay the introduction of fish, shrimp, peanut butter, egg, milk, how many of you followed these guidelines? As good pediatricians, we were trying to follow the AAP guidelines, but unfortunately, they were made by well-meaning people, but not based on a lot of good data. And so now we've gone completely 180, and now the American Academy of Pediatrics this past year in March came out and said, don't follow those guidelines. In fact, introduce around three to four months, introduce a diverse diet early and often when someone is being transitioned off of breast milk or when someone's being transitioned to um, solid foods. So genetics in terms of increase your risk or filigree defects in the skin, diets of fast food and preservatives also increase your risk. Unfortunately, pollution, exposures like viral infections, RSV, rhinovirus, there's a lot of work being done in a Wisconsin cohort now showing that increased viral infections early on increase the rates of asthma later on in life. And then smoking and medicines like chronic antacids, which effectively, potentially, affect how proteins are digested, and so that could potentially increase your rate of food allergies. So this is what we call the atopic march. Um, one could argue that these are just comorbid conditions. But we also think that there's something about the fact that in children that have atopy, that they first manifest that atopy as dry skin or eczema. And then from that, we see a lot of those children march forward, as it were, to having food allergy and then rhinitis and then asthma. And we're trying to understand why those children specifically have a proclivity towards moving forward in their atopic march, but then some other children do not. Some children have eczema and never move forward in allergies. So what protects people and what does not? So in that atopic march, um, my colleagues Gideon Lack in London and Helen Broch, who works with him, put together this hypothesis. And what I love in science is that hypotheses are meant to disprove. Um, we should always try to disprove the null hypothesis as well as prove the hypothesis at the same time. But 
currently the mantra is through the skin, allergies begin. In the diet, allergies stay quiet. And let me explain that a little bit in terms of the science. If the skin barrier is disrupted, which in many cases it is, in London, unfortunately, where Gideon works, 50% um, of the children there have dry skin or eczema. And we think that because the skin barrier is disrupted, and here's where we work a lot now with the dermatology field, that we think that that activates an ancient alarm and pathway that was present during the time of parasites, and that we were meant to secrete mucus and secrete all these cells that activate the allergic pathways. And so with that, a lot of science has now shown that this is true. Raif Sheha at Children's Boston just published a paper in which if you scratch the surface of an a mouse skin and lay in peanut uh, oil that that animal can then get peanut allergies through the skin and that the gut at the same time starts to emit cytokines that activate food allergies. So there are signals between the skin and the gut that are occurring and we need to understand that more. So again, activation through the skin pathways, ILC2 cells activate, secrete IL4 and IL13, which increases B cell isotype switching to then IgE, which is the match that lights the fire behind allergies. So now let's go back to the atopic march. We think that the atopic march is basically both genetics as well as environment interacting. And so you potentially have a child who has dry skin, who has eczema early on, and through this barrier defect, you get exposures along the way, environmental exposures of food or allergens, and that activates this pathway so that some children are then moving forward and having other allergic sensitizations like allergic rhinitis to pollens or asthma to cats, for example. And with that, there are a lot of molecular pathways, but you can take a step back and ask, well, why is eczema increasing in the first place? Why is there more dry skin? Why is there more eczema? And I defer to my dermatology colleagues as well who are doing research in this, but we think that potentially one mechanism is that we've increased since the 1940s when we started seeing an uptick in food allergies. Uh, we have also been including detergents more and more in our society. And a lot of those detergents are not being heat inactivated or being diluted out. And so many people are now looking at the model systems of even one part per billion, which is what we did in this particular study, showing that it really disrupts the skin barrier. And unfortunately for children and infants, we need to be able to preserve that skin barrier. The, uh, our skin is our first organ of defense. And a lot of detergents now are breaking that down because they have proteases in them. So with that, you can think, well, what if you start putting emollients on skin? Um, Gary and others are doing this research. What if you replenish the skin with a natural lipid to be able to have the integrity of that barrier be placed back? And this is an interventional study in Australia because they felt quite compelled to try to use emollients to be able to prevent allergies, and specifically food allergies. This is my colleague, Adrian Lowe, who published this paper last year. And this is, again, a very small study. And this is a pilot study that he um, is sharing the interim analysis with. The intent to treat looks like there's a slight decrease in skin prick test positives to these foods. But importantly is when children use this trilipid emollient, uh, they were able to show in the per protocol population where they used it five times a week on the skin to be able to prevent and look at if they prevented allergy activation, it looks like 0% of the children had food allergy activation through their skin prick test. So this is intriguing data, but very preliminary. So what about the large epidemiological studies. Well, they showed in Europe through a study called the Pasteur study with over a 1,000 infants that if those infants had been brought up on a diverse diet, that it actually decreased the risk of all atopic conditions, asthma, food allergy, as well as atopic dermatitis. So again, potentially through the gut, you actually are inducing tolerance to certain allergens, and that might benefit people long term. That was tested in a very famous study, which all of you are aware of, called the LEAP study. Uh, my colleague, again, Gideon, asked an audience like you uh, in Israel whether or not people had diagnosed recently food allergies in their clinic, and no one raised their hand. And he was very puzzled, because if he'd asked the same question to his UK colleagues, he would have had basically many pediatricians raise their hand. And so he was puzzled, and that is be uh, the reason, one of the reasons why is because in Israel, they started feeding the babies this bomba as a, a basically 
a teething device. And so with that, he then started this study. It started in 2006. Again, for those of us in clinical trial research, it takes a lot of patience, takes a lot of work, measure twice, cut once. He designed the study in about 600 children and randomized those children to whether or not they would be feeding early and often with peanut flour versus not in the form of these cute little puffs called bamba. And lo and behold, the unfortunate item was that the control group, the people that were not eating peanuts early and often, had the highest rate of peanut allergies. But it was not applicable to any other food. So these are specific food prevention techniques. Eating peanut early did not guarantee you that you wouldn't have an egg allergy, for example. And so what worries me the most as a pediatrician here is is the peanut wheel size that you're seeing there in the peanut avoidance group. That's increasing every month that that person's on the planet by about 11%. And these are children that didn't have already a proclivity to having peanut allergy. So there's something in our environment that is actively driving the tendency of infants to become more allergic in nature. So I believe that we now have to actively prevent with strategies. We can't just assume that our complacency or the lack of any action on our part will lead to improvement in allergy and asthma. There's something going on in the environment, and we need to be proactive in our prevention schemes. So what we did at Stanford is we then patented a mixture of items to be able to be used in the gut to prevent, and we're really grateful to be able to march that forward. So diagnostics, um, how many of you have seen this draconian method being used? How many of you have had to suffer from it? It's um, not fun. Uh, and this poor little baby uh, uh, had to suffer that. We also use serum component testing and elimination diets, and then a food challenge to be able to use as the gold standard. So we did that here at Stanford, and we worked with multi-sites with over 1,700 people to use the standard food challenge. This is really important for those of you who are interested to say, well, if I have a patient with hazelnut allergy, what's the likelihood that they're gonna also going to have pecan allergy? Not based on IgE, but actually based on food challenges, the gold standard. So we published this Chicard analysis thanks to our group here in QSU and Manisha Desai's group. But this is a, an important, I think, association pattern of certain foods being co-present as allergies in people. But now let's take it a step further. So you can actually dissect out the proteins and food allergens and find out which IgE related to which component of the proteins associated with allergic reactions, because we really have to worry about safety when we think about allergies. And this was work done by Sandra Andorf, a bioinformatist in our group, where she showed that there was an association between certain components of IgE testing in foods and abdominal pain, for example. So again, we're scratching the mechanism of how these might work. Steve Galley here has done even further diagnostics with the basophil activation test, which you can get from whole blood, where we look at a certain exterior marker, CD63, for example, to look at activation over time. And you can use this actually in a test easily in, that can be applied to babies. And I want to show you that today because it's thanks to our bioengineering department and Cindy Tang and a grant through the MCHRI that we have something to show you today. Um, we can now take this chip, which is a disposable chip, put it into an iPhone, and thanks to an undergraduate who made an app to relate what we find in this microfluidic well that can now be applied in home or in the clinic to be able to look at what someone's allergic to. So for example, you take two drops of blood, you wick it through this microfluidic device. It has 96 allergens pre-plated as an antibody. And then through ELISA techniques, you can actually then have a diagnostic within a matter of seconds that reads out. So this is a prototype. This is based on proteins. It's not based on chemistry, uh, like what happened to our colleagues in uh, Page Mill Road. But um, this is based on science and publications and uh, people that have many degrees, and importantly is that um, we really want to make sure this moves forward, uh, and it's really thanks to engineers through uh, Steve Quake and through students that now we're testing this prototype. So thanks again to MCHRI and to moving diagnostics forward. So this is potentially what we would be able to improve, and then we also want to crowdsource this type of data to be able to improve our understanding of food allergies. 
thanks to a lot of people, and specifically our bioinformatics group and st statistics group here at Stanford, Manisha actually did a CART analysis, which very similar to what Virginia Wynn was mentioning. We basically did an agnostic search on 500 variables to put it into a pool, because not only do you want to find out if someone has an allergy to food, but you also want to understand if someone's going to have a severe allergic reaction. Many patients ask that. What's my risk of having a severe allergic reaction to X, Y, or Z? So we wanted to figure that out, but we needed the gold standard. We needed to have a series of patients that had actually had a severe allergy to peanut, for example, compared to mild, or compared to nothing. So we needed to feed that in, but we wanted to do it agnostically. So Manisha did a CART analysis, and through a set of variables, she actually detected then through these nodes, the most important variable was actually CD63 on the BAT, on the basophil activation test, which Steve Galley um, did in his laboratory. And then the other key nodes were exercise-induced asthma, and then again, uh, approaches to asthma. So asthma risk increases your risk of severe anaphylaxis to a food in addition to your basophil activation test. So we're really excited to be able to provide these types of algorithms potentially to be used um, systematically throughout the globe. So let's talk about therapy. Uh, we've covered a little ground in terms of prevention, covered a little ground in terms of diagnostics, and what I'll do is I'll give you an example of therapy. And we're really excited about trying to deliver on that hope and promise. How many of you uh, were intrigued by or read uh, the recent media on the, the first drug ever that is up in front of the FDA to potentially get approved for peanut allergies? Has anyone heard that news? <laughs> so, thank you, Cynthia. Um, in September, the first ever ADCOM advisory committee met at the FDA to be able to think about giving access to patients who have peanut allergy, a peanut pill, as it were. This is just a mock-up of one. Um, I don't work for the company, but importantly is that this is really delivering on the hope and promise of science. Stanford was involved in one of the initial phase one trials, and we actually shared our data with the FDA to be able to have this company be enabled with their IND. So it's been a long haul, uh, but importantly, for any food allergy medication, the FDA is now giving fast track designation and breakthrough therapy designation. So hopefully, we'll potentially have this as a, a, a one choice for our patients, but it has to be done in an allergy clinic with board-certified uh, professionals that know how to use it because there are safety issues that can occur during food allergy desensitization. We did a phase two study here that was the first ever randomized long-term study to see how long does this last for. If you're going to eat something like this every day, how long do you have to do that? Do you have to do it for the rest of your life? So it's people don't typically want to eat peanuts if they're peanut allergic very hard to get them to eat peanuts. Some kids would love to have Reese's peanut butter cups as a prescription for the rest of their life, but that's not too great either. So um, we need to figure out whether or not you can stop. And so this phase two trial was designed to do that. We basically took um, patients who had severe food allergies, 120, and randomized them to three arms. And so with that, we have a buildup phase. These patients could basically barely eat one-tenth of a peanut when they first came in, and then you slowly, slowly, slowly give them the food every day in increasing doses, and that by about two years or about week 104, you actually can get up to maintenance, and you're eating about two tablespoons worth of peanut butter every day. That's a lot, that's a nutritious dose, but it says that the immune system can be educated and can get tolerized to that level. So we have three groups. After two years, we took some patients cold turkey and went off, and every three months we tested them with a food challenge to see if they were still not reactive. They were blinded, by the way. The other, the placebo was oat flour uh, that was masked and tasted like peanut butter. It was actually a perfume, if anyone wants to know. So anyway, um, we did this trial, and we didn't have a lot of dropouts, which was great, about a 15% dropout rate. You can see that in the comorbid conditions, a lot of the patients had asthma, atopic dermatitis, as well as allergic rhinitis, so these are highly allergic people. And with that, here's our results. We met our primary endpoint. We actually wanted to see at the time that you went off how many people could still have no reaction upon food challenge. And so you see there that 85% of the people were able to get up to two years. They were able to get up to two tablespoons of peanut butter. That's great. That's 85% compared to 4% placebo. 
But unfortunately, when you take that off, if you compare the yellow markers, only 35% maintained their protection, which means you really do have to probably eat this pill every day. And so you might want to ask, well, OK, that's great. You met your primary endpoint. We published this in Lancet. But what, what does it mean for someone? What can I say in the very beginning of a trial? Could you predict if I can go off? So we're looking at those biomarkers now. And again, thanks to Mindy Sai and Steve Galley's lab, this is you know, not um, an incredible receiver operating characteristic when we're looking at a biomarker. But there seems to be trends that there might be some biomarkers. And this is, again, the basophil activation test that might allow us to predict who does well and who might not do well, and who we need to say, please keep taking your medicine every day. And for other people, we can say, well, yeah, you might be able to go off, but let's keep testing you. So I want to wrap this up with thanking you. And uh, we really want to understand causes and cures of ATP. We want to approach this as a systematic disease. I haven't shown you all the omics work and the precision and personalized medicine that we're working a lot with other Stanford investigators. But it includes many of the items here. And um, I really want to thank MCHRI, LPCH, and the Lucille Packer Foundation for Children's Health for all of their support. And most importantly, the patients and families. They are truly the heroes in this. And I I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Started off wonderful, um, um, awesome talk, Kari. Um, I wanted just to um, uh, talk about, um, as a dermatologist, about um, why you're blaming skin um, for everything. <laughs> um, that's kind of mean. Uh, uh, but um, so uh, one question is, uh, so what you're, I think what you're saying is that because of the breakdown of skin barrier, that's the driver worldwide for allergy. Is there selectivity within different allergens? Um, and so that the skin's not so much to blame, maybe something else. But can you just sort of discuss that a little bit, that, um, that, that terrible hypothesis that you're, you're talking about? It's <laughs> a great question. And again, you know, I, I always like to be proved wrong. I mean, that's the most important thing is to be wed to the data, not to the hypothesis. But, um, but importantly is I think it's just one hypothesis I'm sharing with you today. There are many others as well. There was the hygiene hypothesis, but that is also kind of moving towards being questioned a lot because now our colleagues in South Africa and Rio de Janeiro with lots of parasites are also coming down with food allergies. So I think the skin has something to do with it, but not always. There are plenty of people that have no eczema and that get food allergies. There are plenty of people that have skin disease but get no food allergies. So we need to understand this. We're trying to understand identical twins, for example, that are discordant and look at epigenetic factors that might lead to this. So it's not all the skin, but it's just one hypothesis that could be potentially tested. You're right. There's other genetic defects, as you allude to, that are uh, highly related to food allergies, like Sphinx 5 deficiencies, filigrin deficiencies. But then there's others, like Stat 5B, that are associated with allergies and food. And that's not associated with the skin. That's Tregs. So it's a great question, but I am glad that it's brought us closer to dermatologists, at least. There's a silver lining. Um, do you have any explanation for why the uh, peanut desensitization fails? I mean, the one slide you gave of all the multiple factors, genetic, environmental, and so forth, so you have all these, all these uh, inputs going on. But uh, how are you dissecting the loss of desensitization? And when you go back and re- uh, desensitize, do you get the same response or is it less? Um, what, what's going on there? Excellent question. So, you know, when we were able to do these studies, we're actually able to get very clean data to be able to say who failed, who didn't, right, based on a clinical outcome. So at least we can start there. And when we look at the failures, it's mostly due to activation of the eosinophilic pathways. And the people that drop out of studies early, they automatically fail, unfortunately. And we think it's based on some mast cell activation, eosinophil activation in their abdominal um, cavity. And so now we're doing serial GI biopsies and doing some omics approaches to see what was different in those children compared to others that didn't get abdominal pain. Because it's abdominal pain that's associated with the most failures. So whether or not that's true, true, and unrelated, we need to figure that out. To answer your second question, what happens if we go back and try to desensitize those that were desensitized before? When someone loses their protection, do they go all the way back to ground zero? No one has gone back to ground zero, at least in the 3,000 people that we've tested. Everyone kind of starts in a little bit a higher threshold, 
But where they start really depends on other factors, like did you have a recent viral infection? Um, do you have other allergies, like to pollen? So we're trying to disaggregate that data, but it's a great question, because I think to manage people in the field, in outpatient clinics, we're going to need to provide some data around that. So is this tending towards an autoimmune disorder, an auto? Uh, so there are, there are pieces of the inflammatory pathway that get activated that are similar, like the IL-1 beta pathway, um, that are um, shared between autoimmunity and allergy. But for the most part, they are very different pathways overall in terms of what gets activated and what doesn't get activated. So celiac disease, for example, is very different from an allergy to wheat that can cause anaphylaxis. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, you talked a lot about diet, and so I was wondering um, if you've looked at the different impacts that like a person's diet has on their own allergies compared to um, a maternal diet and the impact on the fetus. Excellent um, question. You know, my colleagues uh, in Europe are doing many more of those types of studies in Finland and Scandinavia and other areas. People have looked at the um, effect of hydrolysate formulas, um, and uh, uh, we're part of a guideline now in Europe where we're showing that there's no effect in terms of formula feeding with food allergies or not getting food allergies. And then in terms of what the mom eats, um, there are proteins that the mom can eat during pregnancy and during breastfeeding that actually get across um, the placenta as well as the breast milk that are introduced to the children. But there's no reason to believe, and the data has been confusing in the literature, but at this current time, we do not tell pregnant women or breastfeeding women to, to eat specific foods as long as they're healthy for them. But we don't tell them to avoid nuts or avoid fish. If they're breastfeeding and the child is becoming allergic to that food, then of course we restrict the diet, but only there. We don't, we don't need to tell women now to eat nuts or not eat nuts during pregnancy. Does that help you? But still a lot of work needs to be done. Uh, this is an off-the-wall comment, but I just wondered if you looked at a diaper rash, since we're implicating skin. Uh, of course, diaper rash is the one thing that's down, and it is, uh, was an exposure to your microbiome. So I'm just wondering if that might have been a, uh, you could say, an inoculation or vaccination early. Yeah, so um, Gideon Lack, who I was talking about, who developed this hypothesis, actually has looked at areas in which the most exposure happens. Um, and uh, they've actually shown that because of the diaper area and where they're wiping the wipes that have detergents in them, um, that skin breakdown is uh, one of the most uh, open areas in which food can get through, pass through the fingers of the adults into the skin area. So we're trying to understand that diaper exposure and, under, and get more data on that. Yes, exactly. Right, so we wouldn't want to sort of tackle both, and, but it's, it's good that that actually improved overall, yeah, and, and decreased fungal infections, right? So it's a good question. Yeah. Just a small question. Uh, out of curiosity, this is something that interests me. So you showed in the beginning in the map of the prevalence, and the highest of all was Italy, where it's, and then the risk, the lowered risk, is by Mediterranean diet. And uh, so I was just curious, especially we are from that part of the world. Yeah, I would love to connect with others on that. Um, it's really interesting yeah. when you go to Italy and you talk about peanut allergy. They kind of look at you strange because in Italy it's hazelnut, in the Ukraine it's carrot. In, in Japan, it's buckwheat. So it's really interesting to see all the different countries and what's the highest rate of food allergy in each country. Um, and I think it depends on how you uh, define food allergies. So each of those questionnaires, you could kind of argue, OK, which one really has the highest? But it's not like countries should be competing for that um, <laughs> title. So, uh, But we do need to understand more and use the same variables uh, for country to country analysis. Yeah, so thanks for your question. Um, yeah, so you mentioned like, you know, like changes in the microbiome, but then one thing I was wondering is that like the onset of puberty, like with, you know, menstruation and lots of hormonal changes, have you had any studies on how allergies might change or how they may develop at that time in a child's life? 
Yeah, you know, um, my colleagues who are better epidemiologists and, um, and really are looking into this, there are some uh, children's environmental health centers that were uh, funded by the NIH, uh, NIEHS, when Linda Birnbaum was uh, overseeing that, that I think are following that over time. We do see that when there are hormonal changes, just like is sort of this common adage that when uh, girls go through puberty, they can have, you can see an increased rate of asthma. And so we were wondering if that was the case in food allergy as well. Uh, so we don't see that yet, but I don't think that question can be answered fully because we just don't have the data yet. It's a great question. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, thanks.